Welcome to Souls and Hearts, Be With the Word. I am Dr. Jerry Crete, a licensed marriage and family therapist in Atlanta, Georgia. I am Dr. Peter Melanoski, clinical psychologist in Indianapolis, Indiana. And this is our weekly podcast where we reflect on the Sunday readings from a psychological perspective. Uh, Dr. Peter, it is so good to see you. It is so good to see you, Dr. Jerry. It is so good to see you too. So, and it's great to have all of our all of our viewers, all of our listeners with us to, today as well. Because I believe this is episode thirty-eight. I think this is episode thirty-eight. You're right. Nineteenth yeah. Sunday in ordinary time. That's right. And so this week we are going to be talking about how to stop impulsive behaviors. So if you recall from the readings, we got the really powerful readings of Saint Peter. Uh, on the sea, and he tries to walk on water with Jesus, and he falls out of lack of faith, and so on. So we're going to be exploring that. And I know, Peter, you have a special fondness for St. Peter, I would think. I do, and I have a special, I have a special fondness for uh, impulsivity, too. I have some, I have some of that in my own life. So, so this is a great topic, and it was interesting because as we were doing just a little bit of pre-production on this, we both came up with you know, impulsivity as a theme. And, you know, we don't always come and, you know, with the same coming from the same angle. So this is one of those days where we were thinking along similar lines, which is pretty exciting. So. Yeah, this is rare, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one spoke to both of us, but must be profound, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. As, as some of you have watched us for a while know, we come from very different angles. We've got very different personality organizations, Dr. Jerry and I. So when we come together on something, it's probably pretty obvious or um or at least we're both moved in the same way by grace so. there we are there we are well and we're gonna have an action item we're gonna give you toward the end of the podcast which is about a, a hands-on strategy or approach we've got an acronym that we spent a lot of time trying to figure out <laughs> share that acronym which will help you with as a self-control strategy so if you stay with us you'll hear yes control strategy all right well before right we should say something like we were both thinking attention deficit hyperactive disorder right, right. and although sometimes it has the h sometimes it doesn't right right uh so sometimes there's no hyperactivity um but what is that because a lot of people obviously are aware of that term sometimes people use it very casually mm -hmm. um most you know if you have kids you're bound to have at least one with adhd it seems <laughs> uh, you may have adult add mm -hmm. uh, so so i guess we want to just spend a moment a brief moment like what the heck is add and is it real right um, I want to say that I believe it's real. I believe it's a real thing. <laughs> I know there are people that just think, oh, kids are just kids or whatever. You just grow out of it. But no, I do believe there's, we don't fully understand it, I, I don't think, but uh, are all the, the way the way the brain functions and why ADHD is there. But there's definitely some characteristics that are pretty standard. And somebody with, with clinical levels of ADHD it, it really impairs functioning. It stuff. can actually be pretty debilitating. It can yeah. be pretty debilitating when you're actually in the throes of that, you know. And again, remember when we're when we're talking about these kinds of diagnoses, we're really talking about co-occurring symptoms, right? That's one of the problems in the field of psychology and psychiatry is that a lot of our diagnoses really are sort of more uh, elaborate s descriptions of symptomatic patterns. They don't actually get at the causes of why. So I agree with you that ADD is a real phenomenon, but I think it's multi-causal, right? And I do think that some of it can be grown out of. I think sometimes we have unrealistic expectations for especially boys of six and seven years old for how long they can sit in a chair in a classroom. Um, and some of that kind of response that the responses can look like ADHD. But also there's some of this that I actually think is more neurological. And actually there are more neuro focused types of therapies that can be helpful with it. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm going to go through super fast, like rapid speed. What are some of the characteristics of ADHD? Because we don't want to bore you with a lot of like details or de definitions of symptoms or anything. But I'm going to right. say them really quickly. If you identify with the a lot of these, then you know maybe you have ADHD or maybe you just have some aspects of it. You don't necessarily. We're not diagnosing anybody here, right? Um, but here we go, real fast. Difficulty concentrating on things of low interest. Easily distracted, restless, fidgety, impulsive, rapid mood swings, disorganized, 
starts projects but rarely finishes them, low stress tolerance, low self-esteem, tendency to addictive behaviors. That's my list. Sound good? That was pretty fast. That yeah. was pretty fast, right? That was pretty fast. Yeah. I didn't have time to get bored. I was trying to pay attention you know, and really <laughs> stay with you. <laughs> All right. All right. You're with me. Okay. That's awesome. I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, in some ways, the, the sort of classic uh, kind of uh, lay understanding, the casual understanding, the street understanding of ADHD maps on in some ways pretty well to the actual clinical description. So, yeah, yeah. And, and just to link it to a reading still, you know, I love that Peter always seems to act from the heart. Mm hmm. He, he has a good heart. It's obvious. He has a full heart. And he whenever he's in a situation, he tends to just go there fully. Mm -hmm. right? and, and, and this is an example of that. He sees, um, you know, he sees Jesus on the water. You know, at first they're all afraid. Is it a ghost? And they realize it's Jesus. He's like, if you're Jesus, command me to come out here. You know, mm -hmm. he just throws himself out there. And then, of course, he, Jesus says, come, come. And he, he gets out there and he seems to be doing it for a moment. And then he gets afraid. Well, and, then, and why that's the critical thing is why, what, what causes him to lose it? Right. What causes him to lose the thread? Cause he is walking on the water. Yeah. Right. He doesn't yeah. step out of the boat and immediately sink. He's walking on the water, but in the gospel, it's very specific. What happens? What happens in the gospel? And right. It's, it's the wind. Well, he notices the wind and the waves. He focuses his his attention, or right. one might say he's distracted from Christ to be focusing on the wind and the waves. Right. And remember, Peter's a fisherman. He's lived his life on the sea. He knows what's dangerous and what's not. This was this was some pretty serious chop on the water. This was this was this was, you know, kind of unsafe circumstances, right? So the wind and the waves are high. And and that's what grabs his attention, mm -hmm. right? So, so he's afraid. He's afraid. And he's focusing then on the wrong thing. And that's, what, that's one of these things where, you know, how we use our limited attentional resources, how we focus them is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Because the kinds of things that we focus on are going to be the kinds of things that, um, that are going to dominate kind of what our experience is. It reminds me of Philippians 4, 8, right? Uh, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, right? The, where's our focus? And if Peter had stayed focused on Christ, he would have walked all the way to him. Yeah, yeah. Right? But then it's funny Then he starts, he does get afraid though. And he starts to sink. And the first thing he does, he, again, he's so full hearted. Right. He was like, Lord, save me. Like, right. The next thing out of his, and, and of course Christ does immediately. Right. And so it's this, he's got this great heart. So he's so lovable. <laughs> he is. He is. His capacity for recovery is really good. I think that's one of the things for um, for for us a, as an example is that he's got resiliency, right? And he draws his resiliency. He draws that resilience from Christ in this situation. He knows exactly where to go, right? He's still suffering the consequences of losing his focus, you know, of you know getting away from Christ and being caught up in all of the the uh, the uh, the way that it looks on an earthly plane, you know, kind of forgetting grace, forgetting the supernatural realm, focusing only on the natural realm. And of course, nobody can walk on the water, right? If you're only looking at it from the natural realm. But with yeah. God, all things are possible. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just curious, like, I don't know if, if you have any examples from your life, or maybe I should be reflecting here on my own, of ways in which we've just leaped without thinking and maybe even for a good reason like it wasn't that we started with a bad reason it was just we didn't slow it down we didn't you know and then even when we were in the midst of making a decision or we're doing something in our lives then we get distracted by something like the wind or something or like well we see in kings that fire earthquake all these things are frightening and we don't see god and we lose our footing Right. No, I can I can remember, uh, for example, um, getting uh, summonses right to have to appear in court. 
right, as an expert witness or a fact witness or something like that, you know, and that was like, whoa, you know, getting sort of wound up in that and not having, you know, not losing all perspective, right? Like, how am I going to manage this, you know, da 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 um, you know, not something I was particularly familiar with. I wasn't really a forensic psychologist, didn't really do a lot of that kind of thing, but Hey, you know what? I've got, I've got, um, other resources than just myself. In fact, you know, if I can put my eyes back on, you know, all things work together for good, you know, and I was able to do some consultation with other psychologists, you know, bring, bring this together and, and it worked out really well. So I think there are times where for me, if I'm, being drawn into something that um, that seems outside of my experience, I can actually move more impulsively. I can lose that focus. Um, my instinct when I am on my, uh, you know, when I'm challenged with something is still very much to rely on my own strength. That was something that was really hammered into me, uh, very much a part of my formation. So, so yeah, this whole idea of when we get to the acronym, which I think is just great, of um, of like breaking that cycle. You know, having something very deliberate, a very deliberate plan to follow is really helpful for somebody like me. So for you, well, it sounds similar to mine. Like mine, I, I just get excited about things. I love learning things. I love doing new things. I love opportunity. If an opportunity comes by and it sounds interesting, I'm like, yeah, I want to do that. Yeah, I'll sign up for this. <laughs> yeah, I'll, this. I'll consecrate myself to this. And the next thing you know, I'm like too many things. Right. I don't. And then before you know, I'm overwhelmed. And then. And I can't like, and then I'm not even possibly meeting some of the commitments right, right. that I would, and or I'm just feeling depressed and overwhelmed and tired, and that's me sinking on the water. Yeah, I have a little name for that for me. I call it BSOS, which is stands for like bright shiny object syndrome, right? Just like you know, bright shiny object, woo, you know, like that, you know, and uh, yep, yep. And I yeah. can get that way with shopping too. Like I can get really wrapped, like wrapped up. I, I just installed a new computer system and there's a bunch of peripherals and stuff that I needed to get. And I can very much get very wound up in that to where I'm actually not even thinking very clearly, but I'm just spinning my wheels, you know, and it's not actually even productive, it, although it does use up a lot of energy and can actually burn me out. So, so that's kind of a recent experience uh, from the last few days for me. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder... I mean, let's connect the two readings, at least Kings and this gospel. Yes, Kings. Because I love that passage with Elijah. Mm -hmm. And he hears, you know, he's told, I think that's really cool. He's told, you're going to hear God. He's going to pass right. by, which you right. can't even imagine. And then, and then, of course, we've got the whole thing of the wind and the earthquake and the fire is not where God is. Right. 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 And you would think that that's where it would be, right? I mean, that would be sort of a, a, a classical understanding of the power of the gods, right? That they're going to manifest it in these tremendous uh, natural phenomena, earthquakes and fire and wind, you know, but that's not, that's not where it is. That's not where it is. Sound, which really implies slow it right down. Slow it way down. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I went back to the translations of this. And the Latin is is uh, Sibilus Aure, um, Sibilus Aure um, Tenuis, which is a little unclear. Um, it's not we don't have a great rendering of that in in English, but yeah, in the NAB it's a tiny whispering sound. In the NAB, the New American Bible Revised Edition, it's a it's a light silent sound, mm. and then in the um, Revised Standard Version, the Catholic edition, it's a still small voice, hmm. which to me is more evocative, right? You're making me want to go find the Hebrew, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I, I suspect that there's not a very good translation, and and I'm not I'm not a Latin scholar, but this Sibulus Aure Tenuis that doesn't that that doesn't like that doesn't like clearly identify what the sound was. We know that it was. That it was, um, we know that it was still, it was quiet, it was small. So these are different renderings, and you can just see by the the variation in the translation. That's only three of them, right? Um, I like to look these things up on BibleGateway.com, and you can like see, you know, dozens of translations all at once. Um, right. And um, yeah, there's not a consistent there. But but, but what is clear is that if you're going to hear that still small voice, you've got to have some quiet externally, but also internally, right? You mm -hmm. gotta have some quiet internally. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think that it's important then in terms of our steps, which we'll get to, that there is that internal silence that kind of like Peter on the boat right? He stepped out because he had a focus on God and what I, on Jesus, right? God, but Jesus spoke, I feel like it's his, and Jesus calmed all the storms, which was just Mm -hmm. cool. Right. So to me, these two readings just go hand in hand. And he had, if Peter had slowed down in order to not notice the wind and suddenly get frightened and fall, he would have had to have stayed silent stayed internally silent right and in order to then focus on jesus right and that's kind of what we have to do if we're overcoming add or we're overcoming even if it's not formally add our distractibility we kind of have to be able to somehow not pay attention to the earthquakes fires and winds and and slow down enough to just focus on christ well, I have a little example, a little thing, because yeah. this last Saturday, I went to Saturday morning mass at a parish that's not the one I typically go to. It was in another state because I was out of town. And um, and the, the mass was being live streamed. Um, and uh, it was a it was a, 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 a the pastor had an accent, a little hard to understand. So a couple of ladies on the other side of the church decided they were going to listen to the live stream, but they didn't have headphones. So there was like the, the mass that was being said, and then there was about a 30 second delay. And you, I was hearing like the mass over again, you know, with these ladies like listening to the live stream. I think they were trying to understand what was going on in the homily. And I just let myself get totally distracted by that. Right. You know, there, there was like this distraction and, you know, I was like, like kind of uh, like, how could they be doing that? You know, and I lost the opportunity to be, to still be focused. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the points that you alluded to that's so central here is that, you know, Christ called Peter in the midst of the wind and the waves. He didn't calm everything first, right? He externally, he was providing Peter the graces to be able to respond internally. And it's that internal recollection. It's that internal sense of peace that is really, really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. What a good experience. I, I, I really think, I think you're right. Yeah. He calms it afterward. And so that's our challenge. Our challenge is like, you know, if you think about everything going on in our lives, whether it's jobs and well, there's world stress going on as well. And there's right. their own family stress and there's their own jobs and all this stuff. And yet how do those are our earthquakes? Those are our fires. So how do we stay focused when that's surrounding us. Cause that's what ADD is like. I once heard somebody describe ADD as like, you're on a highway, you're in, you're in the middle of the, you're on the, in the median and there's like cars flying by on your right. And there's cars flying by on your left. And you're not always sure, you know, when can you merge and what are you supposed to do? And it's like, it's overwhelming. Or yes. I also heard it described as like, basically in your brain, it's like, it's snowy <laughs> and you can't, you know what I mean? And you can't get past it. So that, that sounds really stressful. Like, like that's where most of us are already very stressed with things right. going on in our world, let alone feeling that level of activity constantly going on. How do we bring it right down to that whispering sound? Right. How do we select, if you want to put it in more sort of uh, cognitive perceptual terms, how do we select the stimuli that we're going to give our attention to? How do we how do we filter out the noise to focus on the thing that is critical? And that's not just an issue with ADD. That is a real issue with schizophrenia, for example. I mean, one of the descriptions of schizophrenia is the inability to filter out uh, irrelevant or or not, you know, unimportant external stimuli. So there's that sense of being overwhelmed by everything at once in schizophrenia, um, and uh, and not being able to sort through like what's important and what's not. So some of the things that we we say about anxiety apply here too. So right. That is the slowing down of the body, right? The breathing exercises, the muscle relaxation, letting your whole, attending to your physical body, and then maybe also attending to the emotional parts that are, might be overwhelmed. Right. And that's where you allow Christ perhaps to say, I'm here, be not afraid. Right. right. That he gave that to us. That's an emotional vocalization that says be not afraid it's like ah you know i can accept that emotionally at least 
You know, I think you bringing up the body is so critical because I think there's such a huge need uh, in Catholics to be able to downregulate in order to be able to lower the level of autonomic arousal. That is the level of um, of activity in the nervous system, because I think for most people it's set too high. And that's, the, that's what you would feel like if you felt like stressed out, right? Or that there's just too much going on or overwhelmed, right? right? And that has long-term consequences on the body. That's where you get things like adrenal fatigue. It messes with your endocrine system. It has uh, an immune, uh, you know, an immune suppression functions or immune systems become compromised. You know, there's all kinds of consequences to that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's a strategy too when it comes to uh, problem solving and sometimes you know, people are very distractible, very have attention issues or whatever, have trouble with this, right? And and if you haven't attended to your body, you can't even go there. Right, right. But, but the, the first one, I mean, this sounds sort of basic, but it's basic problem solving kind of uh, uh, approach, which is identify what the problem is and then literally brainstorm what your options are. If you, ha- if you stop and do that, you brainstorm what your options are, and then you just go through and evaluate each of those options, right? And then you select the best option and then you implement it and then you evaluate whether it worked. And that, and that, that sounds like maybe ordinary, but a lot of times people are like Peter and they act before they actually go through that. Those, those kind of problem solving steps. And that will just... If you're able to stop and do that, that will slow you down. Yeah, I think people drift into it too. You, you know, sometimes there's not a clear trigger. Like for Peter in this in this situation, there was a clear trigger of his attention to the wind and the waves. But I think sometimes for me, for example, a little thing can pile on a little thing, and I get more and more unrecollected, more and more. Um, distracted, less and less focused on what I'm doing. I'm multitasking, you know, and there's some research out there that suggests that very few of us can multitask effectively. Um, And so, um, yeah, I mean, it can begin to erode your capacity to, um, to adaptively manage the things that need to be managed in your life. Mm. And, uh, and I think that that can happen too, when we, uh, when we lose that, that's, that begins to happen when we lose that recollection. And for Catholics, or if we lose that recollection, we're also starting to lose things like the presence of God, the awareness that we're a child of God, we can fall very easily back into our old automatic patterns, you know, many of which um, are no longer helpful to us right now. So. Yeah, I'm going to throw out another one. It's, I don't know how related it is to the readings, but it's the importance of exercise. And I remember, I, I know that when I do exercise, I have a much better focus throughout the day yeah. than when I don't. Um, and actually, I'm, I can't, I have to go find it now. I don't know if it's out there. It's a from a while ago, but I thought it was an interesting study. I remember reading about that compared children on Ritalin with children who biked for 20 minutes every day. And they found that they had the same effects, positive mm-hmm. effects. Mm-hmm. And something about the bike, being on the bike required, like had a physical activity, but also had a balance. There's a balancing going on where they're balancing, they're having to balance themselves and account for things that they're seeing, physical world. So a stationary bike wouldn't work. I see. It would have to be a physical bike out somewhere where you're taking into account your environment that somehow had a really positive effect. And I've seen other types of phys- like activities, they say for kids with ADHD to do, you know, certain kinds of jumping jacks and different things, kind of stimulating possibly, you know, different parts of the brain. Right. But I do think whatever kind of exercise it is, it's actually really helpful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and again, it's taking us back to that body. And, and that may not be a question that that's different than meditating and down regulating, but it is, a, it's a different form of attending to the body to allow, I don't know, stimulation, brain stimulation, right. as well as body stimulation right. uh, to help with focus. Well, and I, I, you know, speaking of the body too, I, I agree with that, Jerry, but I've also come across folks who are heavily uh, into stimulants of various kinds, caffeine intake, really high, you know, coffee intake, really high, uh, energy drinks, you know, the kinds of things that um, can, um, that can really impair and really impair attention and concentration as well. So there's another aspect of the body of, you know, what do we take in? What are we taking in uh, in order to, you know, in our into our bodies? And how is that affecting? 
how is that affecting our the overstimulated natural yeah. oh yeah yeah that stimulants i'm and, i'm super reactive to caffeine i mean i i find a, you know one one i'm not much of a coffee drinker but one cup of coffee and i will be wired uh, so some of us have, you know, kind of real sensitivities to some of these We're things. We're so different. Well. Like, I honestly could have a drink. I could have a cup of coffee before bed and fall asleep and not have an issue. <laughs> but I was a kid, and I remember in high school, I worked at McDonald's. And back then, it was like the late 80s. And it was, we had this McDonald's. They had built the drive through It was this, but it was this like little little building on the other side of the store. I loved working this drive through I could take the orders, take somebody's order, while I was taking somebody else's money, while I was also grabbing the food off the conveyor belt and making the drinks. And I could do it all at once. And to me, that was exciting and stimulating. <laughs> I know some people couldn't. Like, it was just overwhelming. Right. Like, right. I'll take the price through. <laughs> I don't know. What does that say about me, Dr. Peter? <laughs> I think it has. I think it does say something like, so I imagine that you might be a little more downregulated than me. Right. I, I may run at a little higher pitch. Um, you know, um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, I think it may have something to do with just sort of basic temperament, but I also think there's a huge amount that we can do to help our, help ourselves regulate. And that's something that we're not particularly good at in our culture. And, uh, and there, again, it's one of those, one of those places in where the natural and the supernatural meet, right? Because if you're recollected, uh, in a natural, in the natural realm, right? It's much easier to be recollected in the spiritual realm, right? Because again, grace perfects nature, right? So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be working with that natural foundation. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. For different people, we're all gonna have different things that we're needing to work on. Right, and right, and and point. different solutions, right? I mean, you know, there's a lot of self help books out there. There's a lot of mindfulness is a big, a huge thing in the secular world. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's gotten into the Catholic world. I know Greg Pitaro wrote a book on mindfulness, Catholic, the Mindful Catholic, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so there's a real interest in this, and it's really important for us to be able to be recollected. And again, it goes back to body, soul, heart, and mind, you know, to have some recollection in all of those four major domains. Yeah. Love it. I love it. You know what? Can I just throw something out? Cause, um, I, I think it totally relates, but one thing I just love about the reading in my mind in, in this one, especially the gospel is just the way that Jesus immediately responds. Right. I just I love the fact that Jesus the mess the overall message to me is still Jesus is going to be there when we call on right. him in the midst of our storms. Right. Right. And, and there's something about that. And even when Peter falls into the water, Jesus immediately like helps him. Right. You know, he says, Lord save me, which is, he we need to have that response. That response. Just, I don't know. I just find it this to be such a comforting gospel passage. Well, and it's a, there's a parallel in the first reading too, because Elijah is really stressed out. And, you know, by the time you get to Kings, first Kings chapter 19, if you go back a little bit, he has been through, he has been through the ringer mm-hmm. and he is, he is probably adrenally fatigued. He's probably, you know, struggling with recollection in those four areas, right? Body, soul, heart, and mind, you know, yeah. he's hiding in a cave. Right. Well, all these storms are going on outside, you know, the, the wind, the, uh, the, the, the earthquakes, the fire. Right. And how does God relate to him? Where is the voice of God? Right. Where, how is God going to speak to him in the si- in the silence, in the quiet? Right. Yeah. So there's there's, you know, God is responding to Elijah in with just this exquisite attunement to what Elijah needs in that moment. So the, the care of that paternal love is like so evident to me in that particular passage as well. Yeah. You know, I'll throw out another thing that struck me because this is bubbling things in these readings, but the response, the responsorial Psalm, which okay. sometimes I neglect in my analysis because I'm focused on the other readings, but once in a while something just hits me and I feel like this was a beautiful, beautiful uh, Psalm where it says kindness and truth shall meet justice and peace shall kiss. Right. I mean, honestly, when we were reading that, like that hit my heart very deeply. And, and I think kindness and truth shall meet. And, and I feel like to me, there's a lot of uncertainty in our world. Fine. 
there's also a lot of turbulence in our church. Yes. I think we mentioned before, we don't, we don't get into politics here at Souls and Hearts. That's really not our, 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 our focus, but yet we are all affected. We're, there's a lot of polarization in the church that creates anxiety for people. And I feel like kindness and truth shall meet speaks to me right now. Like it says, that is the path that God wants us as a church to take, which is because, you know, what's the expression like, um, you know, the truth without love is brutal, right? But, you know, the love without any, love without any truth is just sentimentality. I forget right, right. who said that. It was Mother Teresa or somebody. But nevertheless, this is the path. It's kindness and truth shall meet. In other words, even if we believe and we fairly strongly feel strongly that we have the truth, it must be with kindness. Or right. It's not going to have any effect. There's no conflict between these things, right? I mean, sometimes people are fond of the expression like the cold, hard truth, right? Or going back to a few good men, you can't handle the truth, right? You know, but here we see truth and kindness in in complete harmony and justice and peace, right? I mean, some of us may have the experience of cowering before the thought of justice, right? That what we really need is mercy. It may make sense for mercy and peace to kiss, but justice and peace, right? Especially the way that justice is sort of being used now, which is often in a very vengeful way, um, you know, that we want retribution, you know, we want to, we want, we want consequences. Um, and, you know, and, and with that sort of anger and, and vindictive spirit behind it, you know, so these things are not in conflict. Um, but I think that so many people, and maybe your experience in, in clinically is different, because one thing to remember is that we are not primarily media personalities. You know, this, this, you know, the souls and hearts is what we do on the side. We're primarily clinicians, right? That's what we spend most of our hours doing uh, in the week. So in my offices though, what I need, what I see most of the time is people needing to downregulate. Once in a while, I'll see, you know, a client who's really shut down and needs to upregulate. You know, they're like, they're like uh, frozen mm -hmm. um, and they're, or they're numbed out, dissociated. But most of the time it's about you know, kind of down regulating and being able to, um, being able to be calm inside. And, yeah. uh, yeah. that's so a huge thing. That diversion. I just felt like I didn't want to not mention those passages that could spoke to me and maybe it'll connect up, but we do need to get to our action item. I think. Well, no, we need to do something first. I want to talk a little bit about resiliency resilience. Yeah. Um, you know, cause that's, that's the focus of the podcast that I do, which is the coronavirus crisis carpe diem podcast. And around that is this community called the resilient, the resilient Catholic, resilient Catholics carpe diem or the RCCD community. And we have just have had an exciting development. We've had a bunch of people joining that community around that podcast, working together towards greater resiliency. We've just got a, um, an app, a mighty networks app that allows us to communicate and to be able to post things and share. And it's really taking off. So that's really exciting. So if, if you want to connect with, um, with other Catholics that, that are really interested in grounding a psychology and a Catholic anthropology that are really interested in, you know, shoring up the natural foundations for the spiritual life about becoming more resilient and really working on your own issues. You might look into that community, especially if you've liked the podcast, the other podcast that, that we do at Souls and Hearts, the one that I do. So I just encourage people to check that out. Yeah. And the other thing that we've, we, we've got is, you know, your course, Jerry, is like a perfect match for some of this stuff, right? Because so many of the issues around pornography use have to do with impulse control. Yeah. So Slowing down to have that moment to stop before you take some kind of action you'll later regret. So, yeah, so feel free, yeah, if, if to take the Be True course. It's geared for couples. Uh, it can be taken by an individual for sure. Um, but it is, I think, what is it? 24 modules, 24 Three. modules. Yeah. And it's really for when pornography is discovered in the marriage. Mm -hmm. But like you were saying, I think, you know, so many people, people that are preparing for marriage or, or people that may be looking back at a marriage that didn't last, you know, for, 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 for one reason or another, there's so much that can be learned in that course. So Maybe. I'd encourage folks to check that out too. We've had someone take it for alcoholism, and I just yeah. asked me if it would apply, and I said, you know what? A lot, of, it's a lot of the same things. It's, there are different things, so there's some things right. you have to adapt. But any addiction, really, 
Uh, but the focus really is is pornography addiction. Because managing those impulses is such a critical thing when you're looking at a habit control issue or an addiction issue. You know, how do you manage those impulses? So what we're gonna what we're gonna get into now, because you were kind of laying this out for me, this is not therapy, right? We never we never do therapy here in Souls and Hearts, but this is a this is a really interesting technique that you just came up with this great acronym for. So I am really looking forward to you right. sharing that. The acronym is Slipta, S L I P, slip, ta, T A. (laughs) (laughs) It's simple. It's very simple, though. The first one is stop. So, wait a minute. When do you use this? Let's set the stage a little bit. When do you? Um, I guess there's there's a little second. There's a millisecond. Maybe that's all it is. But there's before doing something, before acting on some impulse, there's a millisecond where you can, you can do something different. Okay. Right? So if you're considering saying something, let's say it's your, your, I don't know, your spouse or your teenager, and you're about, you, you, you're about to say something. If there's a tiny millisecond in there that you can go slip up, stop as the stop is, is to stop yourself. There are very, very few things that you can, that you have to say in the moment. Right. There are some situations, but very few. Most of the time, you could stop and slow down and be okay and have a chance to say whatever you need to say maybe later. Okay, so we're, we're talking about this starting when we're in the throes of an impulse, right? When that, when, or maybe there's a temptation, right? We might think of it as a temptation. You know, when that mouse is creeping toward that browser, you know, and we're about to go to some site that we really shouldn't be on, you know, it's that, that second. Okay, and the first thing is to... Stop. Stop. All right. right. The second one is then to listen internally. So that's the L and the I. Listen internally. And that could be where you just take a moment to reflect, you know, and and, and that's maybe even look at options. Do I have more options right now? Do I have to click on that button? Do I have to say what I'm about to say? Or do I have a few other options? Mm-hmm. And listen to yourself, say, okay, no, maybe I can do this instead. Maybe I can, uh, maybe I have three options. I can turn off my computer. I can go to a different site. I can click on that button. Well, okay. And that listen internally might involve going, okay, what, what happens if I do these different things? What will, what will be the result? This one, I'm going to feel shame. I'm going to feel bad later. This one, I'm going to feel a lot better about myself. This one, um, I might enjoy some other site or I might enjoy whatever. If you're talking to a teenager or talking to somebody, a spouse or somebody else, be like, well, you know what? Maybe I, I can say something now and I'm going to get a reactive response because, of course, right now, if I say something, I'm, I'm being reactive. Okay. So that listening internally is also just kind of knowing where we're at. It's just kind of taking an inventory of what's going on. Am I hungry? Am I angry? Right. Am I lonely? Am I, you know, what, what kind of thing is starting to drive, you know, this impulse, like what's behind this impulse? Cause a lot of times it's some sort of internal state that we may never have paid attention to that. has sort of crept up on us because we weren't really attending to certain things that we needed, or we were letting ourselves slip in other ways. We got on some kind of slippery slope. So that listening internally just seems really critical. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. You just reminded me that it's about checking with emotions too. What are right. my emotions? Right. Because maybe what's driving this possible behavior is an emotion. Right. Right. Or it could be a physical state like hunger, fatigue, mm-hmm. um, you know, some other thing that's going on in the body. Yeah. There's that acronym HALT. You want to be acronym hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Right. Right. <laughs> right. You could add sick to it. So stopping for a moment and just self-reflecting. The next one we have um, is P, which is pray. Right. So connect. Now we're listening, but we're listening to God. We're taking. A, right. This isn't just pleading to God. Probably this is more like that that uh, whispering, trying to hear the whispering voice that that we hear in Elijah uh, or in Kings. And so. What does it mean to just take that pause moment? We've just reflected on our own emotions, our own internal state. Now we're just going to look to God a little bit and say, do you have something to share with me? Right. Which is very pleasing to God, 
right? It was very pleasing to our Lord that Peter reached out to him rather than drown in the, in the wind and the waves. Mm-hmm. I mean, in that moment, that was a beautiful thing for Peter to do was to reach out to our Lord and to, and to recover. Yeah. And then the next one after that is to think, you know, what is the best course of action for me? Because we've done all that. We've slowed things down quite a bit. Sometimes we go to, th- if we go to think too soon, we haven't done any of that reflection. Our thoughts are not going to be very productive. Now that we've had time to really listen internally or listen to God, we're, um, we've stopped, we've slowed down a little bit. Now it's like, okay, well, seriously, what should I do? Now we're able to engage whatever the prefrontal cortex a little bit right. and, and make a decision um, that, that has the best chance of success. Right. Because when we're upregulated or if we're real downregulated, any way that we're dysregulated, parts of the brain are overactive or shut down. And we really, because we're embodied beings, we really need to be able to take advantage of the, uh, of the brains that, that our Lord has given us. And then it's A is, the A is action. Now right. we take an action knowing we've done that process. So we're not like Peter falling into the ocean. We're not being distracted. We are, we're, we're, we're making our best, our best choice right. in that moment, or at least we can feel good about making that choice in that moment. Now, you know, if this, if these kinds of techniques are, are not sufficient to help you, I'm really going to encourage you to take a look at like our free self-help course, you know, uh, a Catholic's guide to self-help. It's free. You can take a look at that. That can help, help people make decisions about what kinds of things might be helpful to them and the problems that they face. And then we also have a course called the Catholic's guide to choosing a therapist. So if you come to the conclusion that you really need some professional help, that is a course that is very comprehensive to walk you through it step by step. And it's just a gift to you from us here at Souls and Hearts. That's right. All right. Well, we really appreciate you spending this time with us. We hope you got a lot out of it. We hope that you will get a lot more out of Mass and of the readings uh, by, by joining us. I know some of a lot of people listen before as they're headed to Mass, so they get a lot out of the readings. Some people listen afterward, and then they can do the ongoing discussion, letting the word really sink in at a deeper level. <sighs> All right. Peter, I guess we're, is that our wrap for today? That sounds like a wrap for today for us. So, so thank you for being with us. Thank you for walking with us. Thank you for being interested in the psychological aspects of these things. So really, uh, really this whole podcast exists for you. So really appreciate our viewers and our listeners. All right. So we hope to see you next week. Until then, be still. Believe. Be loved. Be loved. Take good care. God bless you all.